Welcome to uh, this uh, IAS, uh, Distinguished Lecture. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor David Sigmund, John uh, Sigrid Banks Professor of Statistics at uh, Stanford University. Professor Sigmund's uh, research has to do with um, time and space. Sounds like a physicist, but hear me out. Um, consider a time sequence or a spatial sequence, and there is um, a point in the sequence where something significant has happened. Uh, for example, like uh, structural change or uh, the accumulative evidence up to that point has reached the uh, threshold for decision making. Uh, how do you estimate uh, you know, such a time point or spatial point with uh, desirable accuracy. Well, uh, usually you know, formulating and solving this kind of problem uh, requires deep statistical knowledge and novel uh, probability uh, techniques. And that's where Professor Sigmund's uh, tremendous intellectual strength comes in. And Professor uh, David Sigmund has received uh, many awards and honors, uh, including Guggenheim Fellows, Humble Prize, uh, members of American Academy of Arts and Science, and members of uh, National Academy of Science. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's welcome our uh, speaker today. And he's going to talk about the uh, intersection of operation research, kinetic theory, and genetics. David? Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, so you see the abstract in front of you. What I'm going to try to do is is show in a, by a number of very specific examples. There are examples that have really fascinated me over a number of years. Um, that basic problems really are basic. And in some sense, it's a, this is a matter of philosophy, but in some sense, it's why we have a subject of applied mathematics or theoretical statistics, is to try and draw different uh, research patterns under the same, into the same household when they, are, when they are related. So let me begin uh, with a couple of problems that many of you have probably already encountered if you've taken uh, elementary stochastic processes, because two of these show up in virtually every course in elementary stochastic processes. But I'm going to try to say a little bit more about the background that led to these models. This is a so-called Ehrenfest model. Ehrenfests were husband and wife who in 1914 tried to develop a model to explain the difference between the second law of thermodynamics in the deterministic sense of the 19th century and the statistical mechanics. And their model was the following. Very simple, we have a container with molecules in the container and a permeable barrier in between. So there are molecules on both sides of this barrier and they can pass through the barrier. And the specifics of the model are that uh, we take a molecule at random. So here there are four molecules. We have uh, four chances out of eight of picking one of these molecules. We move it to the other side. Then we repeat the process. So it's pretty clear that we're always moving towards equilibrium. That is, we don't, if we have a huge number of molecules here and a small number here, then we're almost certainly going to pick one of these and move it over here. Um, but the process is reversible in the sense that uh, we can also start with uh, equilibrium and eventually find all of the molecules over here and that would seem to contradict the second law of thermodynamics because it would represent an, a decrease in the entropy of a closed system. So here's the formal model. Um, we take a molecule at random and uh, move it to the other side. So the xn, the number of molecules, say, to the left-hand side of the partition, uh, will increase... Uh, 
with a probability that's proportioned to the molecules on the other side of the partition. So uh, here are the transition probabilities. If the number of molecules, say, on the left-hand side is very large, then it's very unlikely that the number of molecules will increase, likely that the number of molecules will decrease, and we'll have this movement towards equilibrium. Um, the formal definition of the entropy of this system is, is this, it's written here, where the, this QN is the proportion of molecules on, say, the left-hand side. And uh, this is maximized when QN is equal to a half. And uh, so, and the steady state distribution is binomial with probability P equals a half. And so it leads, on average, to the maximum entropy. Um, but, uh, of course, you can start off with all of the molecule with 50-50 distribution, and eventually molecules will move to the other side. And this was thought to pose some conceptual problems uh, because it represents a decrease. Now, uh, decrease in entropy. Now, um, I made a little remark here. Aha. This remark... I, I was told that uh, students are encouraged to attend this lecture, and when you're a student attending a lecture, at least in my memory, when you're a student attending a lecture, occasionally your mind wanders. So here's a little exercise for anybody who wants to pursue it, who uh, wants to compute, starting from, say, X0 molecules on the left-hand side, at time n, the expected deviation of the number of molecules from the theoretical 50-50 distribution is going to decrease exponentially. So it will converge to the uh, equilibrium distribution exponentially. But that's the... My thumb is unfortunately too large and I keep pushing the wrong button. Um, so in a deterministic sense, on average, the entropy is going to increase, but stochastically it can decrease. And as I say, there's a, if you want to, this is a simple exercise. Some of the other things I'm going to tell you are not so, so simple, but this one you could do while I'm talking. Um, now here's the same model, or almost the same model, uh, a pretty s similar model that was discussed by two different people, Vestren in 1916 and Erlang in 1917. And Veskren was interested in an examination of a problem like this. His ex he was interested in an experimental apparatus where you have a colloidal suspension. Uh, you don't have two sides of the room. You have a microscope in which you're looking at this colloidal suspension. And at any given time, you can count the number of particles inside the field of the microscope. And then you look. I think it was 1.3 seconds later, and you find that some of these have disappeared, so they're no longer in the field, and so the numbers go up and they go down. Um, and the way he mo talked about modeling this is that uh, from time n minus 1 to n, we take the number of molecules we started with at time n minus 1, we subtract a certain number, but we add a some, more, some others that come in from outside. And the rules of the model are um, that given Xn, the number of molecules inside the field, each of those molecules has probability P of leaving, leaving the field of vision. And there is an independent Poisson number of molecules with a certain parameter nu that will enter the field of, dis of, of vision. And the limiting distribution of this can be easily seen to be Poisson with parameter lambda, which is nu over p, relating the two parameters, the probability of moving out, the probability, and the rate at which things move in. This, exactly the same model was discussed by Erlang, who was an engineer working for the Danish telephone system. And his job was to decide for a particular town in the countryside how many 
telephone lines should be coming in and going out of the town. And what he thought of was, well, how often is it going to be that somebody wants to make a telephone call and can't make it because the lines are busy? So you can make a finite model, but if you consider the this, this same model, and as I say, this one will show up again in virtually every course in elementary stochastic processes, we imagine an infinitely large number of telephone lines. And if this is the number of telephone lines that are active at the present time, then that number can decrease because somebody hangs up the telephone, and that's the decrease is yn. And it can increase because somebody picks up the telephone and tries to make a call. And we use exactly the same rules. The probability of a telephone call ending is p, independently from one call to another. And the uh, number of new calls that are made is Poisson independently of, of the, number that are, the number of calls in service. And both of the, well, Veskren, as I say, he, he was interested in a slightly different question, um, but it involved the physical process of Brownian motion, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Erlang was interested in the same kind of question um, that the Ehrenfests were interested in, which is in equilibrium, there are a certain number of molecules, uh, colloidally, but these are actually colloidal particles, in your field of vision. What's the chance that you get something much larger than that or something much smaller than that? What's the, in other words, what's the chance for Erlang that somebody wants to make a telephone call to uh, the neighboring village and finds that the entire system is clogged up? Uh, I, I mentioned here, just for reference, uh, Veskren was actually repeating an experiment which Perrine, J.B. Perrine, won the Nobel Prize for, which was basically an experiment that uh, established unequivocally that molecules exist. Uh, because in theory, these colloidal particles, which you can view, are moving around because they're being bombarded by molecules of a, of a gas or, or a liquid. And uh, in 1915, Einstein had said that these, this is the way the molecules will behave, and he developed the model of Brownian motion to describe it. But nobody had actually verified this in a quantitative way. And Perrine was the first who did this, uh, but Veskren's experiment has actually had more people talking about it since then because it was a very elegant experiment and it lends itself to these, uh, these different uh, analyses. And so now here's some more exercises for those of you who have already done the first one. Um, here's the model. Xn is Xn minus 1 minus Yn plus Zn, where those are the parameters. Uh, and hence, the change in Xn, given Xn minus 1, is the number of molecules that move out of the field of vision plus the number of new molecules that come in, or the number of telephone calls where somebody hangs up and the number of new telephone calls. You can use this result recursively to show that in the steady state, we have this relationship, the number of molecules in the field of vision is nu over p, which is a, we'll call a parameter lambda. Um, and what turned out, turns out to be important, as we will see when I come back to it, the second moment is given by 2 times lambda times p. Um, and these results allow one to use Veskren's data, which is very very simple experiment, to estimate Avogadro's number. And let me come back to that at the end of the talk because it's not, in some sense, it's disconnected from the current theme, but it's such a beautiful argument uh, that I'd like to say how he did it. Something else that he actually mentions is, suppose that I'm watching people walking down a street and there's a certain section of the street, say from one corner to the next. I want to know how fast they're walking on average. All I have to do is count the number of people I can see in that block. 
now, five minutes from now, ten minutes from now, and there will be di different numbers. The numbers will go up and numbers will go down because some people will pass out of the field of vision. Other people will come into the field of vision. And you can use this theory to estimate their average speed of walking without ever measuring the speed of walking. It's just the number of people leaving, the number of people coming in. And it's the same experiment, that the same kind of experiment that allows one to compute Avogadro's number. But I'm going to come back to that because in a certain sense, it's not really part of the main theme. It's just a beautiful side of that. So here's the mathematical question that was sort of implicit in, in several of these papers, certainly in the, in the uh, paper by the Ehrenfests and in the study by Erlang. Suppose we have this steady state distribution. Most of the time, we'll be pretty close to the steady state. Um, but occasionally, we'll, we'll find that, this, that the process is very far from the steady state, uh, as, it was, as it sometimes is phrased uh, in the case of the Ehrenfest model with the molecules of oxygen over here or over here. If you wait long enough, the molecules of oxygen will all go to one side of the room, and if you're in the other side of the room, you can't breathe, so you're dead. How long do you have to wait? Or what's the probability that this was going to happen in your lifetime or 10 centuries of lifetimes or whatever? That's this question. What's the probability that if we wait until the number of molecules on one side of the barrier is very large and therefore on the other side very small, um, how long do we have to wait? Or what's approximately this probability? Um, that represents the probability in, in, in the uh, Ehrenfest case, the probability of observing a decrease in the entropy of a closed system. Uh, and for Erlang, it was the probability of picking up your telephone and not being able to make a call to the neighboring village. Now, there's a conventional answer which is the one you learn in uh, elementary stochastic processes, which is just to deal with the stationary distribution. Uh, say in the Ehrenfest model, for example, the stationary distribution is the binomial distribution. And so the waiting time, if you start at a state B, far from equilibrium, the waiting time until you return to that state, according to general Markov chain theory, is a reciprocal of that stationary distribution. And so you can see that if B is not close to N halves, uh, that this could be an extremely large number. Um, here's a different answer to the question because it addresses the question as, as I actually phrased it. But it doesn't, this doesn't have a simple answer. We can compute an expression for the probability that P is less than or equal to M. It's of an exponential form. And you should think of it like this. Uh, you have an equilibrium value here, and most of the time we're hanging around equilibrium. But we have different excursions away from equilibrium. And eventually, there's going to be an extremely large excursion. But this is like tossing a coin many, many times and waiting until you get heads if the coin is extremely biased towards tails. Eventually it's going to happen, but it might take a very long time to happen. And that's, uh, that kind of probability is, is codified by the exponential distribution, uh, where this number is, well, it's reciprocal, is the mean of the exponential distribution. And it can be extremely, uh, the mean waiting time for this to happen can be extremely large. Uh, so this is a little more sophisticated answer than this. But if we're only interested in pure theory, um, the first answer is pretty good. Uh, but I gave, gave you an answer here. Uh, we can make these models in continuous time, and it's a little bit simpler to do the calculation. Uh, here, here's a formula I give, gave you. and. Uh, the waiting time in some units is 3.7 times 10 to the 21st for just 10 to the 6th molecules, say. 
So a system that practically can't be observed because it's so small, nevertheless, it takes a tremendously long time to leave equilibrium by a measurable amount. Now, now I want to jump to the almost the end of the 20th century. And as, I, as I say, these, these problems were theoretical problems. You find them discussed in you find them discussed in uh, standard textbooks on elementary stochastic processes. You don't find this formula, which is much more complicated to prove. Um, and in fact, it was almost 100 years before that formula was proved. And the stimulus are one, uh, maybe not the only one, but one important stimulus in the development of that formula was the genetic mapping of genetic traits, quantitative traits in particular. So a quantitative trait, as I, as I said here, is any measured phenotype of an organism. Blood pre the ones that are medically interesting are things like blood pressure, cholesterol levels, so forth. But any, anything you can measure about an individual is uh, potentially of interest. And most of these traits are thought to have a ge a genetic determinants. And particularly for the medically interested in traits, it's of interest to know what are the genes that make contributions to the traits. And that's what gene mapping refers to. Um, there are different kinds of gene mapping, depending on whether we do it. Humans, where we have to proceed by a more or less purely uh, observational model, or um, uh, animal models, say, say mice or, or plant models, where we can do a certain amount of manipulation of the model because there's not an ethical consideration. But we're going to think, in some sense, very generally at first, but then we'll find out that it has to be very much specialized. The phenotype that we're observing should be a function of the genotype and the environment. And now, uh, to make things a little bit more precise, I want to describe a particular breeding model called the intercross. Intercross, we develop two inbred strains which are genetically identical, where this represents just the pair of chromosomes of mouse number one. This represents a pair of chromosomes of mouse number two. These two chromosomes are assumed to be identical because of the way the experiment has been conducted in the past to create an inbred strain. But this, this mouse and this mouse have different DNA at every point on their uh, chromosomes, or every point that we're going to measure. Now, if we cross these mice with these mice, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to have a mouse that has one gray and one white chromosome. And it's, say, the sibling will have one gray and one white chromosome. It's the second cross, that's the so-called intercross, that's really interesting because this is purely deterministic. The second cross, we can have the phenomenon of crossing over, which is uh, we take this chromosome, say, we start with this, but then at some point we pick up DNA from this chromosome and then maybe we go back or maybe we don't. There's a stochastic element to this. And so if we consider two points say A and B, on the, uh, oh, come on. Well, oh, where am I? If we consider two points A and B, there, there's a mixture of possibilities. They can perhaps both be from a gray chromosome. They can both be from a white chromosome. Or there can be a mixture of the two because of this phenomenon of crossing over. And the parameter that we're going to call the probability of recombination is the parameter theta. Um, so with probability 1 minus theta, the 1 half enters in because of the whether it's uh, gray or white. But with probability 1 minus theta, there's no recombination. With probability theta, there is a recombination. And this is going to be our, the basic tool that we work with to study the relationship of the phenotype and the environment. And how do we do that? 
Ah, so this is just a summary of what the picture is supposed to show you. Um, maybe I'll take time to tell you a little story, assuming that many of you are students and you often wonder what's the future have in store for you. The uh, genetic distance between two markers in, is measured in units of morgans or centimorgans. When I first started studying genetics and I saw the abbreviation C capital M, I thought it was a misprint. I thought they were talking about centimeters. But they're talking about centimorgans. The morgan is a measure, an artificial measure, of the distance in which the expected number of crossovers is 1. Centimorgan, the expected number of crossovers is 0 0.01. Now, these crossovers are not happening all the time. They're happening rather infrequently. So the mouse genome has 20 pairs of chromosomes, total length 16 morgans, so fewer than one crossover, one recombination per, mor per, per chromosome. Humans have 23, or if you think about the autosomes only, 22 autosomes, and the total length is about 33 morgans, so there are about one and a half recombinations per chromosome. And in baker's yeast, uh, which is a common experimental protocol for uh, for gen experimental genetics, there are 16 chromosomes and total length is 44 morgans, so they're about two and a half uh, recombinations per chromosome. So these are not happening all the time, but um, well, let's not draw, try to draw another picture. Um, they're not happening all the time, but they're happening fairly often, and if we and this is the model we're going to think about. Um, this is a model that's due to R.A. Fisher. Um, and actually, here's, a, here's a, actually a little lesson. It's due to R.A. Fisher in 1918, Weinberg in 1910. Weinberg was a German. He had all of the same ideas that Fisher did, but Fisher gave things names. He developed, he, when, he got, when he got a big expression, he called it something so that you could sort of internalize what he was doing and see what he was doing. And Weinberg just wrote out big expressions and left them as big expressions. He has all the same ideas, but Fisher's paper is really the foundation of modern regression analysis, and Weinberg's paper is more or less forgotten, unless you're interested in the history. Um, so, we're assuming that the phenotype can be represented as, as an additive function of the genotype and the environment. That's a big assumption, because originally we just said it's some uh, function of the genotype and the environment. And then we're going to make a more, assumption, more assumptions. The genotype could involve many genes, but suppose we focus on one gene, and we're going to call its genetic location tau. So we have, we have this long sequence of chromosomes, the genome, and there's a locus tau. And at tau, there is a gene that's contributing to the phenotype we're interested in. And every place else is not considering it contributing anything. Or, or if they are, they're so far away, we can sort of ignore the, the relationships. Um, and then Fisher's model was what we now call a regression model. He, he said, we're going to write this model in an additive way. We're going to have an overall mean value, an effect of the genotype at the locus tau, uh, where we just count the number of, say, A1 alleles. We imagine there are two kinds of alleles, A1 and A2. We count the number of A1 alleles, and that's the so-called additive effect. Then there's what he called the dominance deviation, which is the amount by which, uh, or let me put it the other, the other way. If D is zero, then we have a purely additive effect, and he just measured the deviation from a purely additive effect by uh, the indicator that uh, there's one A1 allele, and then he put in a random error. Now, the first big step was to rewrite this after some algebra so that we have recentered G of tau. Uh, 
G of tau is 0, 1, or 2. The probability of, of uh, 0, 1, and 2 are the, the probability of, well, the expected number of, of these alleles is 2p because the probability of getting one allele is, is p, the probability of getting a second one is p, and we're assuming that they just add. And then this can be considered an interaction term because it's a multiplicative effect of the allele inherited from the mother, the allele inherited from the father. Now, uh, and, and there's some algebra that goes with this. It's not terribly important. But the importance of this decomposition is very important because it allows us to write the variance of the phenotype, which is what we observe, as the variance associated with the additive effect, the variance associated with the dominance effect, and the variance associated with error. And this is the so-called analysis of variance that Fisher in this paper, talking only about genetics, invented. And then he came back seven years later and wrote, a, wrote a, several uh, very important papers on regression analysis and the analysis of variance. But this is where he started. Um, there's also a story, maybe I stop and, and just tell you a story. There's a story that he had a lot of trouble getting this pa paper published. He submitted it to Biometrica, I think, which was the leading statistics journal of the day. Uh, he got back a, re a referee's report that, while not saying this is rubbish, was not very complimentary, and he ended up not resubmitting it to Biometrica, but submitting it to, uh, I think it's appeared in the transaction of the, of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I'm, I'm not sure. I, but it appeared in a different journal, not the original journal. So uh, uh, the longer you stay in this business, the more frustrating you're going to find the experience of replying to referees. Uh, but maybe the greatest statistics paper of the 20th century had such a problem, so don't, uh, don't worry too much about it. That's easy for me to say because I'm old and uh, I, can, I can afford a, a few of these. You're, when you're young, it's still frustrating. It's very frustrating. Okay. Now, here's, here's the statistic we're going to look at. We're going to look at what if we, if we knew where this thing is, it would be a simple regression statistic because what we're doing is we're testing, we're looking for a measure of the correlation between the phenotype and the genotype. However, we don't know the location of tau and what we'll actually have is a bunch of uh, genotypes spread out all over a bunch of possible locations. So this is say T, and most of the time uh, the phenotype is going to be completely uncorrelated with the genotype, so most of the time we're going to get an observation that's about equal to zero. But the closer we get to here, the more there's going to be correlation between the phenotype and the genotype. So when we're close to the true locus tau, we're going to get observations that are something like this. And they represent, just as in uh, the Ehrenfest problem and in the uh, Erlang problem, they represent a departure from an equilibrium. And we want to know, well, is this departure large enough that we should get excited about it and think we're, we've detected a, a, a locus that's contributing to this trait or not? And, and that then has a, the same sort of becomes the same sort of question. So I guess I've summarized it here. At unlinked loci, the, the mean value after we've standardized things is zero. The variance, it's been standardized, so the variance is one. And the statistic itself is approximately normally distributed. For two loci separated by the recombination fraction theta, we have, we can write the expected value of, of the genotype inherited from the mother times gene, uh, from the mother at the locus T, mother at the locus S, is given by 1 minus theta over 2. That's a very simple calculation. And then it follows that the correlation between ZS and ZT is 1 minus 2 theta. And according to the way uh, 
the phenomenon of recombination is frequently modeled, and I should have said there, there are many models for recombination, but this is the simplest uh, due to Haldane in the 19 teens. This represents an exponential decay. So the picture, in fact, I think I've sort of drawn the picture on the next transparency, so let's go on. So this is what the picture will look like in a neighborhood of Tau. Away from a neighborhood of Tau, we're just going to have things that are sort of zero going up and down. In a neighborhood of Tau, we're going to have something that looks like an exponential decay. And depending on where we put this threshold, somehow I've lost the laser pointer, but where we put this threshold, we'll either be, think we're, if we pass above the threshold, we'll uh, say that uh, we're in the neighborhood of a gene that contributes to this trait. And the question becomes, well, we've made all these measurements, maybe, maybe tens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of measurements. What's the chance of getting something above, above a threshold when there is no trait? And that's exactly the probability that uh, showed up in the, in the problem of, of, uh, of uh, the Ehrenfests. So the so-called significance level for a certain threshold, now I'm, I'm taking the threshold to be z, so if we get above the, the value z, then we'll say, aha, that's, we've, we've detected a, a gene contributing to this trait. We want to know what's the probability when there is no gene contributing to the trait, that is when we're just looking at, at null values. We want to know what's the probability that we exceed that threshold where the maximum extends over the marker loci. The process that I've just described is under certain limiting conditions, an ornstein uhlenbeck process, which is also used to describe Brownian motion, as I'll come back to in a minute. And it's, it's the normal approximation we would get if we standardize the Ehrenfest process appropriately uh, certainly in that case. I think it's not the limiting process, but it's close to the limiting process also for the, uh, for the uh, Erlang model. And here's just a simple, a simple formula that can be evaluated to, uh, for this probability. There, and there are ways to refine this so you get a little bit more accurate probability. Uh, so I won't dwell on that because, as I say, this is a problem, which in some sense is the same as the Ehrenfest problem, but it took until the problem reappeared in the form of genetics before people really appreciated the usefulness of this, of this kind of calculation. Although in the meantime, it had been worked out by people doing pure theory. Now... Um, I'd like, as I say, so the, what, I, what I hope is the message so far is that uh, basic models have a way of recurring. And the reason that it makes sense to think, to think in terms of being a, a, an applied mathematician or a statistician is that um, trying to put these models together under the same rubric so that the next time, you, the next time somebody sees it, he doesn't start from zero to try to solve the problem because uh, certainly in the, when these problems started in the 19-teens and 20s, uh, nobody realized that they, they could all be fit together and, and solved in a unified way. Um, but now they can be. So I'd like to re re return to the ornstein uhlenbeck process as it is frequently used as a model for Brownian motion. So we're back in this. Uh, remember the picture I, I drew of the colloidally suspended particles? We're looking at the microscope. There are the particles. Some of them move outside the region. Others come inside the region. What we can do is just count the number of particles in the region at a given time. Here's the, what has become more or less the standard model for Brownian motion. 
and it's just an F equals MA model. There's the A, that's the derivative of the velocity, is given by a retarding force due to viscosity and a random component due to the molecules that we don't see bumping into the colloidal particles. Those are the two ingredients of the, of the acceleration. So I've taken the M out of the MA and put it over here. Uh, so beta is F divided by the mass, where F, according to a theorem of Stokes, is 6 pi times the coefficient of viscosity times the radius of the colloidal particle. And we can solve this equation because it's a simple first order linear differential equation. And we'll find the velocity as a function of these parameters. I, I, I should say sigma doesn't have an obvious n number attached to it. Beta in principle can be determined uh, by these two relationships. But sigma can't be. However, we can solve for the velocity. We get an answer that involves sigma. We can compute the covariance function, and there's our exponential decay again, with a, modified with the sigma square and the beta. And the expected squared velocity is sigma square over 2 beta. The parameter sigma is unknown, but we can appeal to a theorem of Daniel Bernoulli from the, I guess, 18th century. Uh, an argument which, uh, if, you, if you studied chemistry the way I did, you, you read it and then you forgot it immediately. But it'll appear, you look in your old chemistry book, it will be there. Bernoulli's argument that says the expected squared, uh, the, the mean, root mean, uh, mean squared velocity of a bunch of molecules in a box or colloidal particles in a suspension will be given by something. And it's just an F equals MA argument all over again. And in terms of the ideal gas law, this turns out to be the absolute temperature, the mass of the particle, and Boltzmann's constant. Boltzmann's constant, remember, is the ideal gas constant per molecule. So from that, we can compute xt minus x0. And we can compute e of xt minus x0 squared. And we find out what that is in terms of these various parameters. And remember, that was the equation that I said was important at some point before we got started on the genetics business. What is the, uh, let's go back. So where was it? Yes, here. Uh, this expected, that's the expected squared displacement in now what amounts to a unit of time, but because we're dealing with discrete time. And it's given in terms of these parameters. Um, that means that if we could compute P, and P is the probability that a particle inside this region, an average particle, leaves a region in the time it takes us to make this observation. So in principle, we should be able to estimate P. And when we estimate P, um, we have, we have estimates of everything here. We, if we measure the ideal gas t constant, the temperature, the time interval, that's a unit time between two counts, the count we make at time zero, the count we make at time one, um, divided by this formula, which is just putting all this stuff together algebraically. And there's the number of molecules. And we know everything else, so we can estimate what under normal conditions should be the number of molecules. And uh, if we do that, for Veskren's experiment, we can use the formula of Einstein, and we can estimate 
uh, we can calculate the probability P of leaving the region and then uh, uh, estimate Avogadro's number. Now, the reference that I'm going to give, which I think is a beautiful article, is an article by Chandra Sikar, who won a Nobel Prize for his work on black holes, but this 1943 article uh, is just beautiful, and he discusses many of these experiments. He used Vesgren's data and came up with 6.05 times 10 to the 23rd. Gutorp, in his book on branching processes in 1991, uses what should be a more sophisticated statistical analysis uh, and gets not quite as good an estimate in terms of of the true value of Avogadro's number. He gets 6.29 times 10 to the 23rd. And what is the true answer? I've forgotten. 6.07, 6.06. This, this one's very close to the true answer. This one, first one here is very close to the true answer. But uh, it doesn't prove anything because we're using uh, experimental data, so there's no reason to think that the experimental data is really perfect. Anyway, if you imagine the tools that they had at their disposal to estimate a number and even get the first significant digit correct just strikes me as being absolutely amazing. And as I say, there are many, many sort of standard calculations that go, go into this, but in addition, uh, the kinds of calculations that I've tried to describe here. So, I guess this is, the take, as I say, the take-home message. Stochastic models born at the beginning of the 20th century in different scientific contexts still can be used today for still different scientific problems. Um, and here are references. Uh, the book by David Aldous computes all sorts of non-equilibrium probabilities of the kind that I've described. Uh, Chandra Sikar's article is really the the one that I, I, I just think is, is brilliantly written and has many different features to it as well. Uh, Peter Gutorf's book and uh, Reif's book on foundations of statistical and thermal physics, where again you can see, uh, except I never found out when this book was published. All I can tell you about Reif's book is that I own the copy that was given to me by my daughter when she graduated from college in 19... 85, and uh, the, edition of the, uh, the current edition of the book is still in use at most universities today that teach statistical physics. It's a very deep, very well-written book. Okay, I think that's what I wanted to say. I'm happy to try to answer questions if you have any, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, can we go back to uh, the slides of our back? Uh, oh, maybe let let this uh, let next one. Next one. This one. Okay, this one. Yeah. Um, at, at one time, you know, I was told by someone that you know you look at the equation like this, um, uh, you can see uh, why the central limit theorem is true. And, and the way to look at it is that this part is, is uh, behave like uh, contractions. You know, okay. Make things. Uh, you know. Okay. They concentrate together. Yes. And, and, and this part is that like throwing the noise to spread yep. things out. And eventually they reach an equilibrium. Right. And then, okay. you know, uh, so what, what, what is your comments on that? And, and then you also look at things um, stepwise. Every step, what do you do in order for you to, to get a normal distribution? Uh, I, I wouldn't think of this as being the natural way to try to understand it, but, uh, but I, can see, I can see why somebody would think that this is a, a relevant comment. Um, central limit theorem is a very mysterious result because it basically says no matter what you start with, if you keep adding independent observations with basically the same dis distribution of e as each other, then eventually it's going to look normally distributed. And the only thing you have to know is the mean and the variance, whereas each individual observation that you put into the sum 
can have uh, an, uh, a non-zero third moment, yet in the end, the non-zero third moment disappears. You can have a, uh, a fourth moment, which is not uh, twice the square of the second moment, but in the limit, uh, the fourth moment of the, what you get will be twice the square of the second moment. Um, it's just very miraculous and very mysterious. Uh, I was going to say, I, I mentioned Daniel Bernoulli. Daniel Bernoulli had one of the most ingenious ar arguments for the, for the central limit theorem for the, for the binomial distribution, which was basically to say, how does the distribution change if we go... Uh, if we start at a point i and we have a certain probability and then we move to i plus one and he wrote a recursion and the recursion gives you e to the minus one half x squared when you iterate it and uh, that somehow is the that, that, it's not easy to understand because it is computational. You have to compute something, and then once you have the recursion, you have to iterate it, and then you have to simplify the iteration, uh, and out pops the normal distribution. So I don't, I'm, that's a, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer. Oh, or the other way to look at it, this part is like a particle leaving, caused by particle leaving whatever region you are observing. And this this part comes from your something adding in. Leaving means that things are getting smaller, getting smaller, contracting. and then you're adding in, getting yeah. bigger. But eventually they reach some they, kind they, of they equilibrium, equilibrium. And, and then the running motion, normal distribution, all you know, pops up, right? You know, you know this just. Uh, but but the point, I mean, if even if beta is equal to zero, if there's no contraction element, you're going to you're still going to get something that's normal. So. Why is the contraction aspect a critical point? I don't know. Uh, if zero, that means no particles leaving. Well, that, um, yeah, there's no, there's no tendency back towards equilibrium. That's right. There's no, in this case, it's the force of friction slowing the, mole the movement of the molecules down. Uh, so the, the speed of the molecules just keeps building up, but in a, in a way that leads to a, a normal distribution, but not a stationary one. Not stationary. Yes, I, I have one. Um, we know that the, we know that uh, by adding up uh, negligibly small independent random yes. variables, that the most general thing we can get is something that's independently divisible, okay. which is tied to Levy processes and, yes. and all the rest. And such processes arise in my discipline in economics. Are there other disciplines where uh, things occur with kind of the same regularity that you've noticed here about OU processes um, um, that you know about offhand? It's kind of a tough question, but maybe not a tough question. Well, people, there is a, so, a theory of OU type processes where they have this mean recursion, but where this is not. A Brownian motion, yes. but could be an infinitely divisible process, they for example. Well yeah. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm, I am familiar with that, but uh, the uh, there's a whole, but to maybe not answer your question, but to make a comment that I, I find really very interesting is that. Uh, there's a whole movement to do the so-called single molecule experiments. And these frequently have to do with trying to observe biochemical molecules that do something like just very simple, like they fold and they unfold. Um, and the, the person who's primarily written about that is Xing uh, Chang or Sam Ko, Harvard. And he writes a different equation um, well, I, th I think it's this. I think it's this that changes, and you get a different correlation structure. It's a it's a 
It's not a Markovian. The, one of the virtues of this, whether you believe it is right or not, is that it's a Markovian process and very easy to analyze. His process is, is Gaussian. It's not Markovian. And it has so-called long-range beha behavior, long-range dependence. But he claims that if it's the particular molecular data he's looking at, much better. And, and I think there's an open area there for trying to push that a little bit farther. Uh, there are certainly scientific problems where simplicity beats accuracy and the other way around, where you'd rather have something accurate even if you have to, all you can do is simulate. Uh, but there are other problems where conceptual simplicity is so important that uh, people will not worry so much about accuracy. The ideal gas law, I think, is one. Is one. There's a so-called virial expansion of the behavior of gases, where you put in a bunch of coefficients, and it can be almost any number of coefficients that will improve things when you compute. But do you want to do that? Depends on the goal. Okay, well, then uh, let's thank David. <laughs>